get right into the meat of the webinar. So first of all, I'm going to ask you, I've got a slide that I have a view on, but how would you define talent within your organisation? Do you have a defined um, a term for it? Is it bandied around? Is it something that people know or is it something that you try and steer away from using? So what do you what do you um, you what is your term for it? I'm going to have a little look here as, as who's on here. Ah, Palo, Meta and Kantar, a good friend of mine works for Kantar. And Rachel from KCOM, I think I'm talking to you soon. So it's some really nice to see a number of you here. Ah, Andrea Cunyol from Scotland. I've got a friend locally. It's not the same one, but I would have been surprised if she was joining me. She's definitely not in HR. So in terms of what you might define talent as in your organisation, I know the chat has taken a moment to catch up, so I'll see what your definitions are that you've put in. But um, I've also got as a poll, which I might make it a little bit easier for us to think about. So if you were thinking of talent in your organisation, would you consider it to be a very select five or 10 percent of employees and it being very much performance related? So is it your high performers in an organisation? And of course, can you even see those? Do you know who they are? Or is it pockets of people that have got key skills so if your business has a very specific skill set let's say it's an engineering business and uh, there's a specific skill set in demand or software yeah software business with key skills um is it those ones the high demand skills that are, that are needed maybe the ones that are hard to recruit for or is it something which everybody's viewed as something and it's about identifying key skills everyone is potential talent 100 percent of the organization is potential talent and it's about getting the most out of it. So I'll put that up as a poll and get you to choose one of those options for me. And let's see what your, your sense is here. And there isn't a right or wrong answer, by the way, in terms of this. Um, there are probably other definitions. You might, if you define it as something different, tell me in the chat um, what it is that you define it as. Right, so we've got 50% have done it. <laughs> So Claire's saying the organisations say it's C, but the reality is it's A. Yes, yeah, so you have the spin, don't you? You have the, the official answer, the cor correct, uh, sort of politically correct answer, and then you have the answer that people actually think um, if you were talking to them. I think, Claire, quite a lot of people would, uh, would think that. So um, anyone else want to respond to the poll? No right or answer answers. I can't see who said what, but I'm just giving you a chance to respond if you want to. Um, we've got 65% have responded, so I'll just give you... Two seconds, three, two, one, and I'm just going to end the poll and share it. And let's see what we've got here. So actually, um, so 65% of those who voted say that it's everyone. So it is about identifying key skills and getting the best out of them. But actually, in reality, some other, um, the others, those two others are relevant to your organisations. Um, and it maybe it's overt or otherwise. Um, but Mark's saying it's easier, it's, it's an interesting one. So Mark's saying sometimes people find the exclusive approach easier to understand than the inclusive one. And it is an this is one of the issues I think why I have an issue with the term talent sometimes is that it can feel, um, it really can feel exclusive. And so Steve is saying the same, it should be C, but it's usually A or B. So, yeah. And, and actually, Mike, I think that's a very pragmatic way of putting it. Actually, if from us, if we're those of us in here, which most of us are people in a talent role, I think it is about looking as widely as possible for talent, giving people as many opportunities as possible, giving everybody the chance to get into a role that fits their skills, because then they are going to seem more like talent. And then we get a better result out of them. However, in a really competitive marketplace, there's no doubt that some talent is probably going to be viewed more highly than others within an organisation. I think the question is how objective we are about that and whether we can control that um, as HR to make sure there's a flat enough platform or enough opportunity for everybody to demonstrate their talents. And I think we were touching here on the challenges. So not only can it feel quite exclusive, but other challenges that I perceive with the term talent is that I don't think that organisations always know what talent looks like or should look like, if you see what I mean. Um, sometimes we don't really define it all that well. It might be really quite subjective uh, in terms of, you know, one manager might view something. It might be about who gets on with that person. Um, if we don't have really clear, defined job roles and behaviours, which says what high, low and average performance is in a certain role, it's quite hard to actually be clear that someone is talent in a role if they've made it their own, but are they doing what the job requires? 
So I think that is something um, there where it's tricky is if we haven't defined it and we do need to have those clear role criteria to do it. The other one is I think that talent can be quite situational. So um, think about things like Montessori schools. I don't know if they still exist where they believe that everybody's got their talent. It's about just finding it or, or the concepts in terms of strengths based organisations, which is really about finding um, making sure that if you're a round peg, you're in a round hole, because that person who's around, you know, a round peg in a round hole, they're going to be op op uh, optimising their talents. But if they're in a square hole, they may not be. So it can be situational. And maybe that's it. We've all got the potential to be talent. And is talent management about making sure we have an opportunity to demonstrate those. I quite like that concept. Uh, I do think talent if we do go for the exclusive route where you I think it's a little bit old fashioned now but actually when I was um, in businesses it was quite common to have sort of talent pools and it wouldn't be lots of different talent pools but there'd be the talent pool which would be your top 10 percent 10 percent and it wouldn't unless it's defined very very objectively uh it could seem to be a bit elitist and therefore demotivational to the majority so actually that's quite a high risk strategy um, for an organization the other thing is just because someone's talented doesn't mean that they're going to be a high performer. Um, and I think, you know, maybe you've and a great example there is where you see you might have recruited someone into the organization where they are absolutely brilliant in their previous job. You've paid over the odds for it and then they come in and they don't actually live up to expectations. So, you know, it's really about giving people the right situation and are they performing in that situation? And my sense is that if you kind of go from a talent management um, and it's, it's just putting it in the HR camp and it's all about HR getting performance, does that risk making organisations lazy where they're just saying it's down to us in an HR role to, to recruit and retain talent and put, you know, put the development in place and leave it all down to HR? Whereas actually, um, you know, and those, those people who aren't labelled talent, maybe they're just sort of saying, oh, well, I'm not talent, so I'm not going to operate it. It may make people... If they're not, if you're not in the in crowd um, or you're not labelled as talent, then does that make people work less hard? Does it make people more lazy? Um, does it mean the managers don't put the effort into getting the best out of people? Um, if someone isn't labelled as talent. Does the manager um, not not work not work on developing them and and supporting them and helping them to grow? Conversely, if they're labelled talent, maybe the manager leaves them to get on with it. So I think there are some real challenges with the term, even though we know what it is externally. Maybe it's not the right term in an organisation, um, or certainly not in terms of labelling pools, etc. So I think there are some risks with that term talent. And again, interested to see if any of you feel the same thing. Rich is saying everyone's good at something. So absolutely that's strength thing. Um, yeah. And so actually, is it all about just identifying where someone wants to go, getting the best out of them um, and, and making sure that, that, that they are developed to that direction? Then on to some talent jargon if you like and some of the things and I think these most of these are talent but they go into the same sort of space and actually on the links if any of this is uh, I can see we've got quite an experienced audience here so I think quite a lot of you would know what these are um, but I'll pick a few of them out but we have got a, a sort of jargon buster guide actually that I think there's a link on it coming out to you in the a succession but I think it's succession planning jargon buster Caitlin is it on the link um, so we've got a couple of um, papers on this that will come out to you but I often think about out. a lot of this is the sort of language the jargon that fits around this so in terms of talent is it about us understanding what the roles are in an organization so have we got so far as to identify different job families so job family might be say i don't know project management job family and looking at parallels between those and other areas which would allow you to take people up a career path within a job family or in terms of seniority if you have that sort of thing, it makes it quite easy for people to see their future. And the purpose of talent management is generally to get the best out of talent and to retain it. So a lot of this is where this talent management comes into succession planning and ensuring that we're developing people so that they want to grow within our organisation. And it's never been really more important than it is right now. Similar to that is like a leadership pipeline where you might look at people going up in terms of seniority, in terms of management. And I've got a couple of slides on this at the end. He has this term flight risk. So it could be that you identify people who are key. Now, this sort of term, it might be when you say, actually, this is quite useful. If you identify people in your organisation who have got really key skills, um, you, you need to retain those skills because it would create 
business risk if they left, then those might be people where it's a specific type of talent. It's, a, it's something that's very hard to recruit for, let's say. Um, I used to work for a business where they had some legacy software and people who knew how to develop or actually sort of maintain that software, although they weren't necessarily growth talent of the future, they weren't picking up new skills. If they left, there was a real difficulty in terms of servicing the client base. So that's an interesting type of talent management. It's some of the key skills, retaining key skills. And you'd want to make sure that those people weren't a flight risk, which is basically saying they're not looking to be poached by the local competitors. So you might want to look at ensuring that they are motivated and retained. Any of the other terms on there that anyone doesn't know what that is, but a lot of this is just language that would go into um, assessment and developing things. And then all the sort of things, if you're putting together um, a talent strategy, you might have any of these things as part of it. So you're wanting to retain people. You might identify groups of, of people with key skills or talent pools. Once you've got those talent pools, you might look how you could develop those in a similar way. But all of it, as Mark's saying in the chat, it's all got to be linked to strategy. So we're not just doing it to be nice. We're doing it because those key skills link to our business goals, whether it's retaining existing customers, whether it's growing customers, whether it's delivering a specific service, um, Whatever that purpose might be, it's making sure that they fit within it. So with that in mind, as in our role thinking, yeah, it's important for us to attract, you know, attract talent, recruit talent, manage talent, they make sure that they're being very well managed and develop it. But we need to think what is the purpose of, of it? And you could have slightly different purposes um, for um, a talent management strategy, again, depending on what kind of organization you are, whether you're a, a private, um, you know, a private or a public organization would make a difference. So thinking first, what is it strategically that we're trying to do in terms of talent management? And these are examples that I would say that might be drivers of a talent strategy. And again, I'll put them up as a poll. I'll explain them first um, for you. Actually, I'll put the poll up at the same time and you can think about it. So if you think in your organisation, you may already know what the talent, the purpose of your talent strategy is, or you may think you want to decide what it might be. But these would be examples. And again, there might be something different to this, or it could be a multiple of them. So you can choose more than one if you want. So very often it might be retention of key people or skills. Now, why might you retain those? I gave you an example before, because let's say there's something to do with um, keeping key skills and being able to service existing customers. Uh, it could also be the cost of recruitment um, of pe people. So retaining people is much cheaper than having to um, recruit them. And a different, a different talent strategy could be going, actually, um, we need to develop key skills. Let's say we need to learn how to do things in a different market or the market has moved on technology's moved on in a specific marketplace. So what we need to do is develop everybody, which is more of a, a training and development strategy, but it is still building and developing talent in a certain direction. It could be about engagement or motivation. So your talent strategy is to get high performance. And by do doing that, you know you need to make sure that people are more engaged. So in that sort of aspect, you might be putting your emphasis on what are the skills of like my people managers? Are my managers um, investing time in people, making them feel valued? Are they working with them, giving them clear objectives and talking to them about their career aspirations? So are your that's still a talent strategy because you want the managers to really add value to the people so they feel really engaged to give up their best every single day. So it becomes a high performance organization. Aligned to that is employer brand. I've called it employer brand just so it's a shortcut. What this is really about is being attractive as an employer. So in a, in a workplace where it's very competitive to recruit people and actually there's more and more people can recruit. If we're working in a hybrid environment, there's less geographical specificity. So people join businesses maybe because they think they're going to be developed. So how do I just, if, you know, if I'm someone out in the workplace looking for a new job, I'm going to go for the one that looks like they value me, treat me as talent. Um, and, you know, they've got a good employer brand in terms of people development. An alternative one could be about cultural aspirations. Maybe we want to have more diversity. Maybe we want to actually have more um, women in leadership roles. 
uh, there might be other aspirations that we want to be make sure that we have greater um, equality across an organization. So that might be looking at talents and that could be making sure that if it was a diversity and inclusion um, talent strategy, you might look at whether or not there is bias in your recruitment process or your promotion panels. And how can you make sure that people are getting an equal opportunity or even a positive opportunity to be developed in a certain direction? So you could have a positive um, talent strategy in that direction. I mentioned the profitability one. So you've all had chance while I was gas begging on there to see what your um, strategies might be. Let's share the poll for you so you can have a look. So retention is coming as a, a, as a key one. So it's a lot about the key people, key skills. So that is saying, so it probably combined, I imagine quite a number of you then. So you want to retain people, but you might also want to build those skills. Um, engagement, motivation, company, reputation. Yeah, I think that's it. So, I mean, survival as well, Mike, isn't it? Profitability is often the overall driver and all of those build to it, don't they? Because if you, if you have higher engagement, the likelihood is you are going to be more productive and profitable if you um, retain the best people all of this is going to knock on um, positively so a lot of things start with managing people effectively in the first place but it is interesting I think um, if you're trying to get investment as well within your business let's say you want to you want to pay you know, develop pay, pay for some training or something um, helping make the business case it's useful for you to say this is why we're doing it it's not about being nice and fluffy this is why it's really really important that we invest in this training or we re release people from their day jobs to go on this training or we provide someone with a mentor and make sure that happens or we manage people effectively so when you're trying to culturally make the case um absolutely it all folds up often into productivity and profitability but a stage before um, often makes that case clearer is a stepping stone which um, can make it easier for you to make that case within your business. Any other drivers of talent strategies that we've not heard of do feel free to put them in the chat. So if I was looking at building a talent strategy um, with people these would be the questions so if I was working with a company or if I was internal I would want to think about all of the things we've talked about so far. So I'd want to ask the questions which roles or positions are essential to our business survival or delivering the business strategy. So um, yeah, particular roles, or sometimes you have like an odd extra, a particular specialist in a certain in certain role. So which ones are key? And those may well be roles that you look to make sure that you have clear successes for, or you start developing successes for, because um, they're really high risk if that person um, leaves, if it is one person, which sometimes it is. Then more generally, I might want to know which roles require highly special knowledge or skills that are particularly difficult or expensive to recruit into or replace so that legacy skills that I talked about previously or if you're in something like software there's some skills people say it's really hard to get um, a PHP developers or Python they're just really expensive so in that situation you really want to grow your own and you want to retain potentially um, and then sometimes again just are there those key individuals with key knowledge or experience who'd be really hard to replace so I think those are really quite key questions for just succession planning type things and identify, make sure you don't miss something which is um, a very specific risk to the business. So about avoiding risk. And then you can look more generally in terms of the skills you want to develop, the culture. You could also think about talent from that point of view as well. If you're then trying to align your strategy, I would focus in on the priority business need. So have we identified this specific skill gap or risk areas? And bear in mind, you might have almost multiple, you tie all together in terms of the strategy, but you might have multiple needs. So are there specific skill gaps or risk areas that you want to address? Think about how you can address them in either the short, medium or long term. So you might have a short term recruitment strategy, a medium term development strategy, and then a long term retention strategy about those key skills. I mean, it could also be something about making sure that you've got a great brand compared to the competition, right? Internal, it could be internal marketing to make sure everyone can see it's a really great place to work. Um, it could be about getting people to um, recruit their friends and colleagues and that sort of thing. So having a really good culture is great for retention. Make sure you understand what those skills and experience requirements are that are required. So get down to granularity rather than just generally what it is. Maybe even profiling the types of roles or the skills or the behaviours um, that you want to recruit or you want to retain or develop. Um, and then put in place these developmental career paths 
to address common sense. This is just common sense, right? And the main thing is monitor it because it doesn't happen overnight. So this sort of thing, you really need to um, think about it. I would say on a one to three year basis, um, you can't fix it immediately. And it's, it's organic and it grows and develops, but monitoring your progress as you go. Then I wanted to move on to just talking about career progression pathways, because this can fit into some something in terms of a talent management strategy and it can be motivational so even if you're a really small organization um, thinking about how can you help people to progress to feel that sense of progression so if you wanted to build this sort of pathway which is saying and I'll just stick with project management because it popped into my head that you want to take somebody from being an entry-level project manager through to a you know an executive project manager and helping people feel that they've got progress along the way and even if you're in a small business you could still define the skills and competencies that people need to develop to feel they're progressing um, and then they get rewarded or recognized for that progression what you do want to do is make sure that you um, manage expectations in terms of this so it's a useful thing a career progression pathway because sometimes you can find that let's say i don't know a graduate joins an organization they get put on a graduate development program and they basically think because they've had such an accelerated experience through that development program they think that they're going to be the next ceo um, and actually a pathway is a great way to set expectations that you've got certain hoops to jump through, not automatically going to end up in a strategic role. You've got to do these things first. So defining what those stepping stones are can be really good for managing expectations and retaining people, because actually you can end up losing people who came in really accelerated and they look around going, oh, it's now taking me ages to go up this organisation because they can't see a clear path. One thing that we did in the business that I worked for was we looked at having a pathway for line managers, which is more normal. You, know, you go team leader, cost center manager, etc. But also really important to have something for individual contributors like the engineer, like the project manager, the experts that you want to keep, but they don't necessarily want to become line managers. Lots of businesses are very flat, so you don't want to have this sort of dead man's shoes thing that people don't seem they're progressing unless they go into line management or they don't want to go into line management. So it's giving that, ses that sense. Um, if you're thinking about a, um, a career pathway, think is it about promoting people so they get the status and the reward? Um, is it about development? Is it about both? Presumably you have to develop people to go into them. And again, thinking about how are you going to measure performance up a career pathway? Is it by people actually achieving objectives so they have to perform? It's aspirational and this is about productivity. Is it about demonstrating competence? Is it about giving people development opportunities or is it about them having relevant experience? Is it a combination of all of these? And what you might find is you might be, I've talked about the term career pathway, um, role profiles. You might have, um, or job family, sorry, is a role profile like a, a job description, you might have a role profile for each level of that um, career pathway. And by having that role profile, you're defining what the role is that that person um, needs to, to meet and the skills and expertise that they would have and the competencies they'd have in that role. And that gives people the target. They know what they need to achieve in order to get somewhere. And of course, then you can use tools like 360 feedback to assess against it or uh, other talent planning tools to see whether people are um, already in that place. If you want to put people into a development plan and, and go th thinking about how do people progress up it, should they put themselves forward for the next level or do they need to be nominated? Um, and how can you make sure that all of this links with promotion and development? So there's actually loads to think about. It's really easy to think, oh, it's a good idea. But actually, if you want to put in a career progression pathway, it's quite a lot of work. Um, and lots of things to consider to make sure that you do it well. You can try and simplify it if you're in a smaller business by just almost job titles, but even so to make it meaningful, it's useful to define what the skills are that people need to, to do if you want to make it aspirational where it's transparent and they can see it. This is an example of a, a specialist career path type approach that you might have. So person specialist A, they enter the organization, um, and this is ways in which you can say, OK, how are you going to go? And we're basically saying that um, to get to senior specialist, I may need to demonstrate level two. So this by default is saying we, we've got to have defined what the specialist competency behaviours are. So I need to be meeting specialist competency level two and role specific competencies level two. So it could be a specialist in terms of project management, and it could be that I've got um, communication skills or more sort of general competencies that I'm, I have to demonstrate. And therefore, you could build 
salary bands or around this. And I, I did have car policy, but I think that's about outdated. So something like holiday entitlement or rewards um, people might have that you can build. So it's thinking about how can you reward people in line with going up the, the pathway, not necessarily all monetary. I mean, and don't underestimate the power of a new title, you know, professional consultant principle to give people that sense of status and progress. Because actually people do want to feel they're learning and growing, and which is growth is a real key engagement driver. So even if you can't sort of increase lots of salary, um, thinking about how can you give people that sense of progression is really quite important. Hidden it, it's, it's a different version. You had a version where you would have specialist career path and then you'd have a leadership career path off the back of it. So it's a, it's an interesting topic, this. There's a, a, a number of things that I've, I've kind of gone through there. Really interested to see if any of you've got any questions or anything to add in here in relation to this. Are any of you putting in place career paths, for example, or what is in your remit? Are you putting together a, a talent strategy um, or are you just trying to think more generally about how you can retain people? Uh, do you know what the purpose of your talent strategy might be? please feel free to pop any questions in there i'll keep an eye on the chat in terms of that i hope that gave you some food for thought um i think there's kind of a number of topics uh within there that we've kind of gone through here we go right claire saying how do you change the culture when specialist competency is always regarded as the most important um right so the people who are the recognized so let's say a lawyer right? so the people who are the most um specialist Loyal, though maybe that's a bad example because it's often the highest fee earners, isn't it, that would automatically be doing that. Um, really good question, Claire. You made me maybe me think. I think feel free, anyone else who's got any answers. The angle that I would go down is about demonstrating the evidence between people management and retention, uh, engagement and performance. Um, because and hopefully you'd have it in your own organisation. You may have good examples of managers who are doing a great job and they have better retention, which is actually saving the company money. But if not, you go out as absolutely heaps of evidence outside that um, in terms of loss of talent, it all comes down to um, the style and the approach to people management. The other thing that I would also do if you're thinking just holistically is accept the fact that there are lots of people in lots of businesses that are really great at their day job, but crap people managers. And the reason they're in a people management role is that that was the only way for them to get progression. It's almost like you need to call an amnesty. So I can think of higher education as a case in point that loads of lecturers, you know, academics, they actually don't want to manage people. They want to do research. Um, although if they want to do that, they should also be teaching students. But there are things like that that um, sometimes maybe as a business, so if it's linked to fees, Claire, so classic, you see some of the professional services firms, you might go, do you know what, that person, you know, the best salesperson I ever came across was an absolutely terrible sales manager, absolutely appalling. And the best thing to do is just let them be a really good sales manager if you possibly can and put someone else in place as a manager who's got the people gene. Um, and that will give you more engagement overall. So that's a bit like I was saying in terms of the career pathway, have a career pathway for the specialists and have one for the people managers so you don't ram specialists into people manager roles if you possibly can um so yeah i think so similar sort of sort of thing yes so you if you've got evidence internally so an engagement survey so you might show that certain business areas of the business um are more highly engaged than others you can see how the people management is the tricky thing is that will help you for leadership development. The tricky thing is if they then go, yeah, but they don't bring in as much money as us. And that's that's the tricky argument um, that you're there. Mike's saying that would come down to overall company view. Yes. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's I don't know if any of you have got that same experience, but I think there, has, there certainly has been a time in the past where the only way for people to get promoted was to be a people manager. And that creates poor management. Yes. Which is. Yeah, that's what Pedro's saying. I think we're all we're all in, in agreement here the solution how is the solution for trying to have career pathways for both maybe creating a bit of an amnesty um for it and sorry i didn't finish the point about professional services firms sometimes they have um people who whose job it is almost to be the mentor or coach they create people who are the nurturers if you like um, and they have that as a specific role almost in a matrix so um the line person is all about the numbers and the money and maybe the hours 
and you've got someone else who does more of the pastoral care and that can be a solution sometimes a luxury in many of the organizations but um, in those organizations it can work um, any other questions for anybody please do put them in there um, I hope that you found that uh, interesting I felt like I, I felt like it, I'd sort of stopped a bit rigidly there so uh, I'll just keep an eye on any other questions that you have uh, I bet I, I would definitely, definitely say, I don't know whether they need to do a professional leadership qualification just because I think that you sometimes you're paying ILM or something for something you don't necessarily need to do. But I definitely would say that if you put someone into people management role, you, you should almost give them pre-training, um, ideally. So you could have a, a pathway um, for the actual behaviours coming up there. Um, in fact, have I got one here? Right, have to un unhide my, my slides but you you should develop people and in my view you should ideally identify people who want to be people managers and give them some development in advance when they get that people role give them people management development something like 40 percent of people in the uk get people management development it's really poor there's no wonder we have poor people managers and also make sure that we define what good people management looks like um, and you can put it into your performance management tool you can say this is what's expected and define what good people management looks like in terms of measuring it, Mike, measure um, measuring so measure soft skills. Three hundred and sixty feedback is one of the most useful ways, in my experience, of measuring soft skills. Um, so you get you get the behaviours that you want people to demonstrate, the competencies aligned with that role, and get feedback on that. And you could also do three hundred and sixty on a regular basis. So we used to, I worked for Siemens, we used to do three hundred and sixty on every line manager um, every two years, I think it was. So everyone got and it got some feedback on that um, rolling basis. So definitely would say there's a business case. It's almost we should, I don't know, it's so common that we don't train people, if that's a good point. So there's loads of information on 360. Yeah, and we also have a 360 feedback. Good point, Caitlin, um, if that's something that anyone wants to know more about. I'll just whiz through my final slides just for anyone else. If you want to come along and talk uh, in an open way, then we do the coffee club, which is this week it's going to, it's next week it's going to be about OD and it's just a handful of us joining up sometimes there's loads of us we put into breakouts we have a few questions and it's just virtual networking it's really informal um, and we share information and ideas with each other actually some of the stuff we're talking about here would make a good coffee club session so we've got two of those coming up between now and Christmas and here's all the rest of this this you'll have access to all of this information um, on the slides that come out to you